Okay. Simple pole in the ground is where it would start. And the shadows, the angles made by the shadows are going to be dependent upon the latitude, the distance uh, away from the equator. But actually, this is all you need, this in a circle, in order to plot all the celestial movements, at least the ones you know visible from the human perspective on Earth. So if you were going to, you know, you wanted to be able to determine the solstices and the equinoxes, you don't need to erect monumental architectural structures to do so. A simple pole in the ground will, will give you what you need. You can find the solstices and the equinoxes from just tracing a circle around a pole. And like you said, if you had one year of observations, you could easily get all of those uh, alignments with a high degree of accuracy. So now here, if we start looking at some of the examples, now these are just a few. I mean, there are many, many examples. And I just pulled a few together here to kind of show people. This is one of the, the more famous ones. Um, now this is summer solstice, of course. So this is the opposite of where we're at now. This would be six months later. But, you know, you're looking along the axial line of Stonehenge. And then you've got this outlier stone here, which is the heel stone, it's called. And when you draw the axis through Stonehenge, through the heel stone, and the point on the horizon more or less demarcates the rising position of the sun on summer solstice. So that pretty much, that was the, the, the axis of the, of the monument. So this axis was determined, and then the monument was built around that axis. Now, there's actually a lot more celestial alignments in the layout of this, but you know, we're just going to focus on the solstices. And this is Fort Ancient. Now, this is relative to our time of year, because this is your um, winter solstice sunrise. And you can see this is Fort Ancient is a vast earthwork complex. And when you stand at the center of the structure and look to the east, of course, it's not exactly to the east. It's going to be north. I mean, sorry, south of east. You have this notch in the hill here. And the notch perfectly lines up with that position of the sunrise. And so this is, you know, you could, you, in, in each day, what will happen now as you're facing this is that the, as the, the days and then the weeks come after the solstice, you'll see the sun moving back to the north and then it'll hit hit the equinox and then it'll come back to the south so you know once a year it's here so they is, were obviously commemorating that moment is that contemporary with serpent mound uh i don't know i it, it's you know serpent mound actually is i think some been some new dating on it that suggests it's much older or at least somewhat older than the previous dates which really isn't isn't surprising okay so let's go to the next one okay so casa rinconada in chaco canyon new mexico an aerial view let's actually i think i have a um yeah so there's a summer solstice sunrise alignment at casa rinconada there's a there's a slot and let's see do i have it here yes okay so here you see what it says solstice niche e right here it's You've got these small upper niches, but then this particular one here, it's, you'll notice how it's larger. And there's an, a window, and on the morning, that's this window that you see right here. And then on the summer solstice, the sun ray will shine through there, and it will illuminate this notch or niche, sorry, right here. I think you can probably find... I've got photographs of this but i was not here on the summer solstice so i don't have photographs of the actual event but i know there's some people have made those photographs and put them online maybe brad you could possibly grab one of those let's see this is a different presentation this is the presentation on the chaco and culture but i actually have a little bit more additional slides that will help to clarify what how this thing is laid out so here's here's this overview again then we have this diagram. So if you look carefully, this is from a, a book, Astronomy and Ceremony in, Prehistor in the Prehistoric Southwest, edited by John B. Carlson. Here's the sun rising on the summer solstice. So this is going to be, you know, as far north as it's going to rise in the east. And then a ray of light comes through this window and illuminates the niche on the opposite side. So there must have been, I'm guessing, some type of an effigy or something that was probably placed in that niche that 
was illuminated by the ray of the sun that morning. I've done an overview here so you can kind of see here's here's your here's the window and here are the elements of the various structure. Here you'll see the sun out here and then there's the sun's ray coming in like that. So it does this, you know, summer solstice and does this one morning of the year. It's exactly lined up. So this is obviously not a coincidence. They clearly meant to enshrine this moment in the structure of Casa Rinconada. And of course, the whole of Chaco Canyon, we are now figuring out, is part of a gigantic astronomical complex that has not yielded up all of its secrets yet. But you can see there, the so there's there it is on that morning. I believe that they allow people in there to witness this. That'd be something we should do. Oh, yeah. So is it just a solstice alignment for the summer? There isn't uh, an equinox or a winter alignment? I haven't seen anything about the uh, winter, but if you look here, here's examples of astronomical alignments in Chaco Canyon after Anna Sofair's work in 1997. And uh, like I said, the whole canyon is, I mean, the whole infrastructure is laid out astronomically. It's like a, a large astronomical ob observatory, and it's got lunar as well as solar alignments in it. See, so here you've got the sun, you see you got the moon. Here's this moon alignment coming along here, and that moon alignment, let's see if I've got it here. Yeah, so this is the lunar wall alignment at Pueblo Benito, and then what happens is the moon rises right along that alignment, and that's what she's showing here. So Pueblo Benito is oriented and placed along this line alignment right here that runs through the whole canyon. So, um, and if you look down here, here's the built-in alignments. You've got solstice alignments here. You've got lunar alignments. And the whole complex is laid out to enshrine those events. So that's uh, very interesting to me that they would do that. So uh, let's see. I think I had a few more here of... Oh, yes. And then Serpent Mound. This is a great graphic on the website moon at serpentmound.org. But this is showing that the egg in the serpent's mouth, its axis is oriented to the summer solstice sunset. But then the coils, the axis of the coils, you'll hear here, summer solstice rise, winter solstice rise, spring equinox rise. Oh, you might need to share that screen with us, Randall. Well, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. Participants can now see your application. Good. Okay, so you got a summer solstice sunset defining the axis of the mouth and the uh, long axis of the egg, the elliptical feature there. And then the coils define the two solstices and the equinoxes. So if you draw an axis um, like this from this central point, and, you know, it'd be interesting to go. I've been there, what, two to three times now, I guess. But if you look out this way, the axis of this coil defines the summer solstice. The axis of this coil defines the winter solstice. And this is your going to be your due east-west right here. Um, and here's your north-south line. So it looks like Serpent Mound is another astronomical type of observatory. Doesn't it also have lunar, lunar alignments? Uh, yes, there are lunar alignments. I couldn't tell you exactly right now what they are. I remember seeing a diagram that showed similar lines like that, but it was, um, I think it was the minimum and maximum lunar standstills. standstills. In Serpent Mount. I think so. I'll have to look it up. Well, it was, you know, minimum north rise, mac maximum yeah. rise, that, that sort of thing. All right. So here's a photograph mm. looking along the axis of the egg, and there's the summer solstice sun setting in the west. defining that alignment. And then here's the Etowah Mounds, Cartersville, Georgia. You got a summer solstice sun rise alignment, and it's defined by these two mounds right here. Mound, this is mound A, the big one, mounds B and C, and that alignment right there. And I don't know if you can still see it, but maybe 25 years ago, when first few times I visited here, there was still a visible depression in the very center of this mound, which... I guessed probably held it's a, some kind of a, a foresight pole, something that was there. And then that lined up on the distant horizon, there was two hills that kind of created a V. So when you projected this line here, yet towards the east, 
to the northeast, then you would see the sun rising between those two hills. Oh, uh, yeah. If that makes sense. And then you've got a winter solstice sunrise alignment at Newgrange, Ireland, right? And I think we've got a graphic here to show that, Newgrange, Ireland. So when you project out through the entry tunnel, it's lined up with that same position. Interestingly, so think about this. I presume that there was some kind of a ceremony going on. Obviously, they wouldn't build a structure and put an alignment in here and then not be out there present witnessing this particular morning with some type of a ceremony. But what's interesting is you've got this event happening here in Ireland, and then jumping back, you have this happening the same morning on the other side of the world, a third of the way around the world. Yeah. So you've got two completely disparate cultures geographically removed from one another, but they're both observing this same event by utilizing these, these structures to do so. And then you've got Bighorn Medicine Wheel. Check this out. So you've got the axis of that goes right to the summer solstice. So as you're facing here, now the, sum, the summer solstice sun is rising in the northeast. So it's, it's going to have, if you had been watching this in the weeks leading or months, you know, leading up to this, you would see each morning the sun, the sun rising over the hills. And then on the morning of summer solstice, it'll rise right here. And then it'll pause here. You'll probably actually see it rising at this point on the horizon several days in a row. And then it'll start migrating back along the horizon this way. And then you've got, of course, the famous alignment at Chichen Itza, which is a spring equinox, sunrise alignment. And you can see that as the sun is rising, it would be off, off you know, to the right here, shining across the stepped platform here throws this play of light and shadow on the balustrade so you can picture as the sun is rising these coils of light are descending the balustrade they're moving down and then at the bottom you've got the serpent so this represents the serpent kukul khan so this was a pretty elaborate construction and clearly this had to have been thought through this was not something that just happened by coincidence it's i'm sure it was planned into it right from the beginning so Teotihuacan, there's also alignments we could get into it. Summer Solstice Shark Cathedral. This is a, a really interesting alignment here. Here's the layout of the cathedral, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the sun over here where the, the position of the sun at high noon. And you've got these two buttresses here with a with a window in between them. And on this one day of the summer, summer solstice at high noon, the sun is high enough in the northern sky that a ray of light can actually pass between these two buttresses and then pass through the stained glass window and enter into the interior of the cathedral. And if you stand at the interior and look up towards that window, which, as it says here, uh, dedicated to St. Apollinaire, who was a Christian saint. And of course, that is a hint right there that it has something to do with the sun. Take a look right up here. Right there, there's a little clear niche in the window right there. And so when that sun strikes the window, a ray of light will come through that niche, that little clear chink of, of perfectly clear glass, and it will shine through. A ray of light will come down, and then on the floor of the cathedral right there, right near where the transept crosses the nave, there's a very obvious tile that's been set a slant to the others and is larger and is a different type of stone so that it stands out very clearly and then very conspicuously. And then right there, there's a little metal tenon on that tile, right? So at the moment of high noon, summer solstice, that ray of light coming through the window strikes that tenon. That's wow. pretty wild. <laughs> that is, that's pretty cool. Uh, I would say that's very cool. So, you know, it, we find over and over again, this interest in, you know, these celestial movements. And, and I think a lot of people now know this, but for a long time, it was not really appreciated by people that the Great Pyramid had an indentation 
had indentations in its side. It's actually not four-sided, it's eight-sided. See, look at it. And here it shows up, but it only shows up like this when the sun is, is basically due east. So this is a photograph taken at 6 p.m. on the day of the equinox by the Royal Air Force. So the sun is setting over here in the west, shining, and you see the shadow, and the line of the shadow lines up here. And then you can sh see that there's this very shallow but very distinct inset in the geometry of the pyramid. That would have been, I'm sure, much actually more obvious when the casing stones were still on there. So again, this is a phenomenon that just shows up on the equinoxes. Uh, just as an aside, one thing that struck me about the pyramids when we were there recently in October was when you're standing, you know, the entrance is on the north side, on mm -hmm. the northern face. So when you're standing out there looking at the entrance, the pyramid is on the southern sky. The southern sky is right behind it. Yeah, it yeah. The entrance. And so when we came out in the evening time, out of the entrance and came down into the, you know, the platform below and looked back, it's like you could see the planets in this arc going over, I mean, right over the peak too. Yeah. Yeah. When you're standing at a certain position and it, I just, I don't know, for some reason that struck me like, wow, it's, it's just like a big pointer. Yeah. Like an arrow. And, you know, arrowhead pointing. Yeah. Yeah. That is very cool. And then look at this next slide here. This is, you know, your summer solstice sunrise as seen from the Sphinx. Now you can't tell me that this is just accidental. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So the Sphinx is looking directly at this position. This again, summer solstice. So this is that most northerly position. Okay. And then as let's... seen from the Sphinx yeah. is what the picture says. Right. Yeah. But... Not, yeah. Yeah, that must be. Yeah, as seen from the Sphinx. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you find this phenomena all over, and I think it raises some interesting questions about what the motives were. And, and you know, it'd be one thing to find a culture that obsessed with the sky and these celestial movements, but it was like all the ancient cultures had this was one consistent theme that seemed to unite all these various cultures all over the world. And, and we find the stuff in some of the very earliest examples from ancient Egypt and, and other ancient cultures. I mean, we can look and see. I don't have it handy. Maybe I can pull it up here if we take a little break. You know, some of the alignments of the, um, a lot of the monumental earthwork structures of North America are you know, Newark is a good example of where there are multiple celestial alignments incorporated into its ground plan. To me, it raises questions of why were ancient peoples so interested in this that they obviously, in some of these cases, went to great efforts. Fort Ancient, that's a massive complex of an enormous amount of earth that had to be moved and piled up and then not just randomly, but set out in such a way that it enshrines these alignments. So that to me is a, is a question worth pondering and trying to actually come to some kind of a conclusion, some kind of a, a, at least some kind of a working hypothesis of how this phenomena could come about. Well, yeah, they're, at the very least, you could say there were many ancient cultures were very interested in celestial movements and yeah, they, they aspired some kind of importance to them and encoded them in their structures in various ways. What they thought those movements meant is a big question. Right. Yeah. But for some reason, they seem to really want to track that motion. And why they wanted to do that's a good question. 